Hey, welcome to Crossroads. A woman's house was visited by the FBI after she made some posts on Facebook. And folks, the video of this has since gone viral. People are questioning whether this could violate constitutional protections on free speech. Why is the FBI visiting people's homes for things they post on social media? Because again, you know, we see videos of this happening in Europe and we see it happening in other countries, but now in the United States, right? Now, what was left out of most conversations, though, was questions of, well, what exactly the woman posted to make the FBI visit her home. I had a look myself. Some of the women's public posts included open calls for people to join so-called physical jihad. Uh, the case also, though, fits into a broader pattern. I'll show you that, by the way. U.S. authorities seem to be showing up, showing deeper concern generally on another side of this over a possible rise in radicalism and actual threats of terrorism. And I know we've gotten numb to a lot of this because the terms have been so flipped upside down for so long that patriotic Americans are getting labeled the same way. But this issue also ties in with deepening rifts happening among Democrats, also mainly around Israel's war in Gaza, and is ironically also getting traction among conservatives who are opposed to federal authorities questioning people over online posts. Let me show you this. To start, here's the general story that's going around, right? If you really read most media, this is what they're saying. Reason says the FBI spends every day all along, according to the direct statement from one of the FBI agents, interrogating people over their Facebook posts. At least that's what agents told Stillwater, Oklahoma resident Rala Ab Abdel Jawad when they showed up at her house to ask her about her social media activity. Three FBI agents came to her house and said that they had been given screenshots of her posts by Facebook. And they decided to go visit her about these. Let me show you the video of the FBI visit that her lawyer posted online. What we'd like to do is just have a conversation with you about some social media posts that you've made. Would you be willing to talk to us today about that? No, I would not. I would like you to later talk on with my lawyer. Okay. Do you have identification? Do you have a card or Cards? That we can reach no. You? No. I'll get back to you. Now, remember, the FBI visit to the woman's home was about posts she had made on Facebook. Now, we don't know exactly which posts they were concerned about, but Luckily, her account is public, so I went and had a look myself. <laughs> Let me show you a small sample of what she's been posting. Uh, this one was posted twice, one, under her, one with her photo, one without. Uh, one just had text, another one, the same words again, but with her profile photo behind it. And what she says is this, International Union of Muslim Scholars the call to physical jihad has been made to all Muslims. It is the duty of all able-bodied Muslims to join the armies of Muslim nations whose leaders will march forward in jihad. Allah be with you and us. Amin. Now, what could a call to physical jihad possibly mean? Uh, doesn't that mean carrying out something physically, not just maybe an opinion or speech? And of course, what does it mean to join the army of a Muslim nation in the act of engaging in jihad? Now, of course, to be fair, it's unclear what she exactly means by it, but given the context of jihad and joining the armies of a Muslim nation in jihad uh, to carry out whatever that will may be, uh, it does seem to be a bit concerning, personally. Uh, beneath the image, she wrote, quote, we win or we die. Now, look, to be fair, it's possible this is also about calls to physically protest. We know, for example, that pro-Gaza protests are ironically becoming a thorn in the side of the Biden re-election campaign. When Biden and Obama went and campaigned in New York just recently, pro-Gaza protesters were actually harassing the Biden donors. And uh, there's videos of this going around, actually. They were harassing them and they were, as they were coming out of the building. Normally, you'd think that these people would be allies they're turning against each other. Uh, it's also starting to deepen the divide of Democrats overall. It seems most of the content is focused, you know, on this lady's thing, back to it, uh, back to her Facebook posts. It does seem a lot of the content is just focused on criticizing the Israeli war in Gaza. And some of the recent posts also have criticisms of ISIS. Um, it seems she started posting these mainly after the incident. 
uh, very likely to suggest that when she says join the armies of Muslim nations, that maybe she's not referring to ISIS. Now, there's also some that are a little more pro-America, while, again, clarifying her stance on what she opposes. Uh, just looking into what, again, she actually stands for and why the FBI may be visiting her. She said this on January 4th. She said, let me make it clear, I am an American, I am a Muslim. This is my nation. I do not wish calamity on the nation nor my fellow citizens. I do wish calamity, she says, upon the evildoers in our government who perpetuate dangerous national and international policies that weaken our nation, put us in danger, subjugate us, and destroy lives around the world, alongside the bigots who want evil for others because of their inferiority complex and blind hate for those who are different from them. Now, again, interpret that as you will. This is the woman's post, again, who was visited by the FBI about her posts online. But, you know, just generally speaking, this is becoming one of the ironic shifts in the country. Again, the pro-Gaza and, ironically, sometimes even pro-Hamas people are turning against the Democrats, and so are many of the Democrats, who, again, are tend, tend to be more pro-Gaza and pro-Palestine and anti-Israel, but Biden is being forced to be pro-Israel and anti-Gaza to an extent because of the stance, again, of the U.S. government, uh, meaning it's causing rifts within the party. They're breaking at the seams over this issue. It's one, of the, it's one of the inherent contradictions that the party is having to face now. They cannot be both A and B. They have to be one or the other. And, of course, as they choose A or B, uh, one of the camps is turning against them for, again, turning against the issue they believe in. And as this happens, of course, a lot of conservatives are also, interestingly, becoming a little more, um, let's say, forgiving of, of, ironically, even some people who are being targeted for terror investigations. Uh, in fact, a lot of the conservative websites were defending this woman, despite, again, her calls for physical jihad. A lot of conservatives on this ground feel like, you know, the FBI is treating them in the same way. They feel that they've been labeled as, quote-unquote, MAGA extremists. Uh, they feel they're being attacked, investigated, that if you go and protest at a school board meeting, that the FBI might investigate you as a terrorist. And so because the federal government has so muddied the waters on the definitions of these things, uh, they've caused people to view government overreach, if you would call it that, in any sense, including if it's a Patriot Act violation where you're suspected of terrorism, uh, in the same light as all the other attacks against anybody who the Biden administration seems to be targeting, which is frankly a lot of people. Now, meanwhile, the federal government recently ordered Google to turn over information on every single person in a certain time frame who viewed several different videos on YouTube and, you know, different live streams. Now, I'll be talking about this more after a short word, though, from our sponsor. Experts agree one of the best ways to protect against financial uncertainty is to diversify your portfolio. Learn how physical gold and silver can secure your retirement funds from today's economic challenges with a gold IRA from American Hartford Gold. You can safeguard your wealth with no penalties or taxes when you transfer your current qualifying retirement accounts. Call now and our precious metals specialists will send you a free information kit, no cost or obligation. American Hartford Gold, a trusted industry leader with an A-plus from the Better Business Bureau, has a five-star rating from thousands of happy clients. Whether you are getting physical precious metals in a gold IRA or delivered to your doorstep, we offer only the highest quality gold and silver. For your peace of mind, we also offer a no-fee buyback commitment, a low-price guarantee, along with free shipping and free insurance. So don't wait. Call the number on your screen today and secure your financial future. Hey, welcome back. Now, look, meanwhile, there have been some other incidents along similar lines to what we've been talking about, where Americans are being targeted for online activity. Now, we discussed one where a woman was targeted, of course, for being suspected of maybe posting things that were pro-terrorist. And, of course, people, interesting, they're coming to her defense. And recently as well, though, because this is a trend, the federal government ordered Google to turn over information on every person who viewed several different videos on YouTube and different live streams. Forbes said this, in, just a, in a just unsealed case from Kentucky, reviewed by Forbes, undercover cops sought to identify the individual behind the online moniker Elon Musk WHM. 
who, is, who they suspect of buying Bitcoin for cash, which I don't see a problem with, potentially running afoul of money laundering laws and rules around unlicensed money transmitting. In other words, heck, I thought most people bought Bitcoin like that, right? Uh, you can't use cash to buy Bitcoin. It has to be a digital purchase so that they can trace it. But regardless, they're going after this individual. It notes that in conversations with the user in early January, undercover agents sent leaks of YouTube tutorials for mapping via drones and augmented reality software. So the FBI agents sent him these videos in a private conversation where they were posing again as, you know, they were undercover, right? They then asked Google for information on who had viewed the videos, which collectively have been watched over 30,000 times. 30,000 people, potentially, of course, now. It says the court orders show the government telling Google to provide the names, addresses, telephone numbers, and user activity for all Google account users who accessed the YouTube videos between January 1st and January 8th of 2023. And briefly let that sink in. They're suggesting that if you watch a YouTube video, then Google has your name, your address, and your telephone number. And that every single video you've watched on YouTube is traceable to that and can be obtained by law enforcement if they, give a court, if they get a warrant to get it. Now, specifically, federal authorities wanted the identities, names, addresses, phone numbers of every person of those 30,000 who viewed that video between January 1st and January 8th of 2023. Again, you know, about eight days, right? The government also wanted the IP addresses, your internet protocol address tied to your home. If you have a router or internet connection in your home, you have an IP address that is traceable to you. And they wanted the IP addresses, it says, of non-Google account owners who viewed the videos. Meaning they weren't just going after people who, again, if you log into Google, and again, your account is tied in with your phone number and they know who you are. They also wanted just the IP addresses, people who are not logged in, but Google would of course have their IP address on record because they apparently keep that, right? Now the police argued, it said, there is reason to believe that these records would be relevant to material and material to an ongoing criminal investigation, including by providing identif identification information about the, per about the perpetrators. In other words, of course, that was their application for the warrant to search, and their search warrant was Google, because Google had the records they were looking for. So in other words, what happened was federal investigators are trying to find the identity of a suspected online criminal, his crime, using cash to buy Bitcoin, uh, because the federal government is now trying to regulate cryptocurrency, something that was coming down the pipeline for a long while. Part of the benefit of cryptocurrency for a long time was its untraceability, that it's off the books, that the banks do not control it, uh, that it's more close, I think, to like silver or gold just in a digital form. But of course, they've begun undoing that. And the federal government now wants to be able to trace, uh, again, Bitcoin, other cryptocurrencies, and purchases made with that. If they can find your identity tied in again with your purchase using a digital payment, again, which can be traced to you. Um, that lets them have a better idea of how the money is being used and lets them monitor online payments using Bitcoin. In other words, because of federal law, Bitcoin and other things are no longer cryptocurrency. Uh, they're becoming a lot closer to normal CBDCs, centralized bank digital currencies, because of the federal government's ability to trace them and monitor them. And so as they're creating regulations to monitor online payments using digital currencies, this individual went against it. Again, he used cash to buy Bitcoin, and the FBI is now after him, or so federal agents, right? And so to find out you know, who this guy is, to try to arrest him for doing that, the federal agents sent him, because they were communicating with his online persona, sent him YouTube videos, and then after sending him those videos, asked Google to give them information on anybody who viewed those videos within an eight-day period. Now, this is apparently a trend. There have been other cases like this. And the story continues, notably, saying police asked for information on people who watched the videos related to what looked like a swatting incident in a separate case. That again, it wasn't just this individual they're looking into, there's other cases just like this. There was another case, for example, you know, if you know what swatting is, it's something where people uh, say there's a bomb threat or a hostage situation, 
the police has to send the SWAT team. Uh, they break down people's doors. They hold people at gunpoint. And it's oftentimes very dangerous. There are individuals who do this as a form of harassment, where they call police and say, hey, there's a hostage situation at such and such address. And what they do is they send the SWAT team after the person. Uh, there's been moves to put an end to that, maybe arresting the people who call in fake police reports. But because of the, some of the loopholes, it's hard to do that. So an individual had swatted somebody, and then people watched on these live stream cameras, which are in different places around the world, uh, where you can watch, of course, like surveillance footage. And individuals were watching a place get swatted. The police wanted records on who was watching that video. Now, look, in another example, it says, involving an investigation in New Hampshire, this is it, the Portsmouth police received a threat from an unknown male that, had, that an explosive had been placed in a trash can in a public area. The order says that after police searched the area, they learned they were being watched over a YouTube live stream camera associated with a local business. Federal investigators believe similar events have happened across the United States where bomb threats were made and cops, and cops were watched via YouTube. They asked Google to provide a list of accounts that viewed and or interacted with eight YouTube live streams and the associated identifying information during specific time frames. That included a video posted by Boston and Maine Live, which has 130,000 subscribers. Mike McCormick, who set up the company behind the account, IP Time Lamps, said he knew about the order to investigate, adding that they related to swatting incidents directed at the camera views at that time. And so, again, they're trying to find out maybe who did the swatting incident. Now, personally, I'd say I hope police can find somebody if they make bomb threats. If you're threatening, you know, to bomb somebody or something like that, I frankly, I think you should be arrested. I don't believe in swatting. I think it's terrible. I think if people do that, they should also be arrested. You have a lot of far-left activists, by the way, who do that very often against conservative influencers. Now, I don't have an issue also if police investigate someone, you know, suspected of global financial crimes. I do have an issue, though, when it comes to, for example, them trying to monitor digital currencies, uh, because frankly, I think the regulations on that set up the structure to create a CBDC. I disagree with that. But I also, on another note, think the feds should look into people on the first story we're talking about. I think they should look into people if they're calling for physical jihad, right? And so all these stories, they relate to crimes or potential crimes or at least threats of crime or things that might raise concerns, right? But these stories, of course, are controversial for other reasons. We're becoming more aware that what we watch and what we post on the internet works as a type of legal record against us. Every single thing that you say or do online has a record of it, it is saved, it is maintained, and those records can and possibly will, if you're ever arrested, be used against you in a court of law. Every single website you visit, every single YouTube video that we watch, Everything we choose to post on the internet, all of it, everything is recorded. And the companies that have this data, they can cooperate with authorities to reveal it to them. In other words, there's no such thing as privacy on the internet. Everything you watch, everything you do, everything you post, uh, everything you read, all of it is recorded. Now look, of course, things like this have been going on for a long time. And in the case I just mentioned, you know, authorities, they did take the time to get warrants. They had to go through a process to get the information. They couldn't just view it themselves in this particular case. At the same time, though, a lot of doors have been opened by technology that allows for surveillance and tracking that is frankly far beyond anything that even George Orwell could have warned of. You know, for example, GPS. If you have your phone in your pocket, if you have your phone in your car, your movement is traced, whether you have your, uh, again, uh, location data turned on or off, it still locates you. Uh, that is actually record as well, not only for federal authorities, but even for private businesses. Companies can sell this. If you were to watch Dinesh, D Dinesh D'Souza's documentary, uh, 3000, sorry, his mules one, right? 
If you were to watch his documentary, you'll know that one of the things they did as part of their investigative process was got the GPS locations of phones of the individuals who were accused of ballot stuffing. And, you know, of course, that is public record. It's sold mainly to advertisers and such, but can also be used for criminal investigations. Uh, also, your pseudonyms are collected. If you have different online monikers, if you have different online nicknames, whatever names you use on you know, video game platforms or different websites or anything, those are recorded as well as your pseudonyms connected to your different email accounts and even your various email accounts also are collected as record. Now, the list goes on, frankly. If authorities want to know where someone was at the time and date of a crime, even their phone tracking data can be obtained and used against them in court. Where they can say, hey, um, you know, a crime took place in this park at X time, on, you know, on X date, and your phone was seen at that park, what were you doing there? And maybe you were an innocent bystander taking a stroll through a park during the time that a crime took place. You could be part of that investigation if that were to happen. Because again, your phone tracking data is public record. The companies can buy it, you can buy it if you want. And of course, the government can obtain it. Now, again, stepping back from all of this, it's part of a delicate balance that, you know, we've been giving authorities the tools to access. I mean, the way law enforcement normally works is we give a certain subset of individuals certain authority uh, that they need to enforce the law. In traditional law enforcement, of course, we give them the ability to stop people, to question people to an extent, and to, if there is evidence of a crime taking place, to get a warrant to investigate said crime. Uh, part of the process, of course, of investigating a crime is looking into things, but they normally have to have a reason to do so. They can't just overstep that line and look for a crime, right? Uh, cr law enforcement is reactive, not proactive in most cases. They can't look for crimes that have not yet happened for the most part. Now, of course, we also take steps to ensure they don't overstep certain boundaries. You as an individual are protected against certain violations of your rights. They can't search you without probable cause in most cases. In fact, if a federal agent asks to search you, you can simply say, are you asking me or are you telling me to clarify whether they actually are telling you that they have to search you versus just asking your permission to do so. Uh, you can also, for example, ask what their probable cause is to make sure that they have legal you know, authority to do what they want to do. Uh, but of course, the issue we're now facing is technology allows for some of the deepest overstepping of these boundaries we can possibly conceive of. Technology has given record to everything we do. Uh, technology has made a written record of our daily lives, where we go, what we watch, what we purchase, what we say, everything is recorded. And so from a certain standpoint, it's you know, a dream come true for law enforcement because if they can of course get access to that data, they can pretty much investigate any crime and prosecute things very quickly. There's a tempting nature in terms of law enforcement being able to access that because you could say, hey, it makes us all more safe. The flip side of it, though, is that there are protections on the individual established for certain reasons. There's always a balance between safety in terms of law enforcement and force to the government, and you as an individual having individual rights and sovereignty. The sovereignty of the individual is one of the cornerstones of our law as well. Government cannot do illegal searches and seizures, for example. And the founding fathers of the United States took this into account because we've seen that that can lead to tyranny if those laws and those boundaries are overstepped. We've seen that in, for example, countries like under communism, the former Soviet Union, under the Nazi regime, the, not, the national socialists, I should add, uh, that of course they did not respect these boundaries. And we saw the types of abuses that can result when government is able to not respect those boundaries. And we also know that if law becomes more tyrannical, if your beliefs, for example, become grounds for investigation and prosecution, if your political views become grounds for investigation or prosecution, if, for example, you believe in something that's not approved by the state, maybe you think face masks don't work, uh, maybe you don't believe in the, you know, the shots and so on like that, maybe that would be deemed a crime in some cases. And we saw that it was on the borderline of being like that with the COVID pandemic. 
Now, do you want to have authorities with that type of access and power in that case? This is the unfortunate nature of law, this very delicate balance. And again, one of the things we're facing is that now the federal government has found a workaround to access the personal data of Americans because, again, of digital records. And one of the ways they do it is, of course, through official warrants. They can go to a court, say we have evidence or reason to believe a crime took place. We need to be able to access the records during this time frame based on these particular categories, oftentimes just an IP address or whatever else, maybe. And, of course, they can get it. But there's a second workaround we've been seeing. Now, look, the government technically cannot just monitor you themselves. They can't, for example, monitor your IP address unless you've committed a crime, right? Unless you're suspected of it. They can't just go and monitor every single American and look at your GPS tracking data and see every video you're viewing on YouTube unless they, again, have established some kind of plausible reason to be doing it, right? A probable cause. But they found a workaround, uh, which is, of course, something more serious. And this workaround is something happening on a very, very large scale. I'll be talking about how this is happening, though, and also how Biden's diversity agents don't want the government using terms like jihadist anymore. All of this and the live Q&A will be answering your questions. It's going to be only on Epic TV. So for the rest of the episode, folks, if you're watching on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Rumble, Come and join us on Epic TV, EPOCHTV.com. We have an Easter sale right now, and I hope you all had a wonderful Easter. Uh, it's $1 for six months. That's $1 for six months of Epic TV. So there's no reason to not come join us. Click on the link in the description below to get our special Easter offer. It ends this Thursday, so again, get it now. You'll be able to watch the rest of my show today as well as every day this week and for the next six months, as well as our special reports, our documentaries and different series, and I'm doing a lot of them. Let me show you a quick trailer of my special feature on why the Constitution matters. It's called America Rewritten. You can find this and more of our specials only on Epic TV. The American Story was once seen as a light of strength and freedom for the world. It created a government by the people and for the people, for rights were given not by leaders, but by God. Yet now the very fabric of the nation is under assault. What is the real story of America? Why did the Founding Fathers choose a republic over a democracy? And what would the world be if the bedrock of the American Constitution was lost.